It was during the period that Mike was producing 80 Days that I became part of his life. I'd seen Mike at several parties and knew him. It was fun being with him. I was attracted to him, but not overly. The day after my separation from Michael Wilding, Mike called me and said he had to see me right away. He just told me. I mean, that was all there was to it. He said I was to meet him at MGM at 2.30 and to meet him outside the administration building. So I waited. He was 10 minutes late, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour. I said, oh. And I didn't really want to leave, so I went into the administration building and I left a message that I would be in one of the vice president's offices, Benny Thor. So I went upstairs and I was sitting in his office and I had my feet on the table and was sipping a Coke. And Mike charged in, I mean, rather like a bull. He just charged in without saying a word to anyone. And he came over to the table and he grabbed me by the arm, still without saying a word, just dragged me out of the office, down the corridor, shoved me in a, into an elevator, still not speaking, marching me along another corridor, breaking my arm. We went into a deserted office. He sort of plunked me down on a couch, pulled a chair around, started in on a spiel that lasted about an hour and a half with a, without a stop, saying that he loved me and that there was no question about it, but we were going to be married. Well, I just sort of looked at him and, well, I guess rather the way a rabbit looks at a mongoose. I was absolutely sort of hypnotized. All kinds of thoughts were going through my mind. I thought, well, he's, he's out of his mind. He's, he's, he's stark raving mad. <laughs> Two weeks off, he, he sent a pri private plane down to location to pick me up and fly me away for a week, two weeks. And, well, he was waiting at the airport, at the bottom of the steps, and I was terribly nervous. After all, I'd, I'd hardly seen him, but we'd, we'd gotten to know each other so intimately and closely over the six weeks on the telephone, but I didn't know what my reaction would be when I saw him. And I was absolutely terrified, and then I opened the... Not I, the stewardess opened the door and I was the first one to get out and I ran down the stairs of the plane and he was waiting with his arms open and I flew into his arms and, well, it, it was like I'd been there always. Anyway, we became engaged then. and Wells. I'm here to talk about a friend of mine, Mike Todd. Mike, of course, could have done it much better. Nobody could talk about Mike Todd like he could, or about anything else for that matter. He was surely the most colorful of all the great showmen. Mike was an American original. He had big dreams and he had the imagination and the courage to make the dreams come true. The motion picture around the world in 80 days was made and triumphantly made despite the 
doubts of the professionals, the costs, the odds, and the advice of his friends. One day in mid-production, Mike had a $240,000 payroll to meet and less than half of that amount in the bank. But life was good, and after a 10-year struggle, he figured he was holding another jackpot hand. Now he wanted something more. He wanted a girl to share the fun he knew was coming. The payroll could wait. He'd borrow the money tomorrow. In the meantime, he did what any ordinary man in love would do. He went out and bought a little token of affection for the girl he decided to marry. When Mike bought me my engagement ring, I think he was almost as proud of it as I was, but he always used to make a joke about it, saying that it was uh, 29 and 7 eighths carats because 30 would have been vulgar. <laughs> I call it my ice skating ring. When Mike was a kid, carrots were something that were in a bin next to the beets in his father's general store in Bloomington, Minnesota. Avram Hirsch Goldbogen was the seventh of eight children in his family, but the first to be born in America. His father, a part-time rabbi, had a tough time making ends meet in the new world. But not young Avram. He was busy out in the streets. He worked in the Nickelodeon at the age of six for a street corner pitchman when he was seven. At eight, he put a lucrative twist on shining shoes. He grew like a weed through asphalt. And to his friends, and especially to his younger brother Dave, Avram was the golden boy of the Goldbogans. Todd's love and fondness for his mother was a wonderful thing to behold. And you really would have to be right there to understand the deep affection that he had for Ma when he came running into the house and yelled, Avrumala is here! Avrumala from the Gelt! Mamala, Mamala, this is Avrum! And uh, Mother immediately responded with, Oi, Montana Kent, my best son, Avrumala, Avrumala! Fats Lebitsky was a classmate. He could testify that for Mike, even school wasn't a completely unprofitable experience. You know, it seems like uh, there were only yesterday when Michael Todd came to our neighborhood in Chicago, called the Wicker Park area, and Mike was a pretty sharp little kid even at those days. He decided to run the crap games in the schoolyard of the school called Wicker Park. Now, we had to knock uh, two fellas, or fight two fellas, uh, and a matter of fact, they beat him to death, but they admired his, uh, his intestinal fortitude, so they let him run the games, and he became a partner with these guys. And I was to get 10 cents, I'll be honest with you, ladies and gentlemen, to be the lookout for those that know the gangster jargon. I was to watch out for the cops. Incidentally, I never was paid. And if he were alive today, I believe that he would owe me about $140,000 in interest. Todd, as Avram was nicknamed, left school when he was 12, having become the youngest apprentice pharmacist in the history of the state of Illinois. During Prohibition, he made a small fortune selling medicinal alcohol. He took a wife when he was barely 17, and still in his teens, he set up a promotional outfit that specialized in high-pressure closeout sales. When the talkies came in, he moved to California and built sound stages. As a contractor, Mike made and lost a million twice by the time he was 21. Having heard the words spoken on the sound stages, he became convinced he could write. This was when the crash of 29 left him without a construction business. So at the height of the Depression, he returned to Chicago and scratched a living writing jokes and sketches for radio and vaudeville. But it was the Chicago World's Fair of 32, where he made his first big score in show business with an act elegantly labeled The Moss and the Flame. This involved a lady wearing a transparent asbestos garment under the one you see. The gimmick, of course, was that she flitted too close to the flame and her costume got burned off. Mike, in later years, said, I burned up four girls before I got it right. Actually, not even a false eyelash was singed. Mike got hot and made money touring the flame dance and other attractions on the road. Now, with a new press agent, Bill Dahl, he was ready to attack Broadway. Many, many years ago, uh, I got a phone call from Mr. Todd. 
and he was about to do a, a musical that no one had any faith in called uh, The Hot Mikado. No one had ever heard of me, Mike Todd, or The Hot Mikado. Bill Robinson, a very famous tap dancer of that day, was the star of the show. The Hot Mikado got smash notices, but did only mediocre business. We pulled all kinds of stunts to promote it. But it was 1939, and people were spending what money they had at the New York World's Fair. The show closed. We held awake on a rainy Saturday night in Mike's office. And we heard Mike get off the elevator and come sloshing down the hall. He was drenched, and he walked in with a wet brown paper bag. He had been to the fair, and the fair had given him $10,000 to move the show. This is an a utterly unbelievable thing for a show to get a reprieve after. When they close, they usually close, you know? And he came and he took this soggy bag and flipped it up in the air, and it was full of money. $10 bills, $5 bills, and the money came raining down. It was a very beautiful sight. And uh, Mike said, go ahead, fellows. So we all were snatching the money out of the air. The show was a hit as the fair asked Mike to take over other attractions of the amusement area. Mike changed merry old England with tabloid Shakespearean plays into the dancing campus with the world's biggest dance floor. He hung up some Spanish moss on little old New York and changed it into gay New Orleans with entertainment all around the clock. Another of his meat potato shows at the fair offered tall dames and low comedy. And the lady he persuaded to be the star of this was Miss Gypsy Rose Lee. The fair was everything Mike told me it was going to be. My picture was even bigger than Stalin's. 42 feet tall towered above everything else at the World's Fair. That is until the night of the big storm. The picture was done in sections, four sections, and I buckled in the middle. <laughs> oh, God. Mike was there, selling tickets, ballyhooing his own show, standing out front, hooting and hollering. Mike was the most exciting man I'd met in all my life. And when he offered me a job, boy, I grabbed it. There was just something about him that was vital and wonderful, and I was so proud and happy to be working for him. When the fair closed, instead of disposing of the scenery and the costumes, as most producers do, Mike saved every scrap of it, and he opened the biggest nightclub in the world in Chicago on the north side. The theater restaurant seated 2,500 people. Mike wrote all the ads himself. You can get a full course dinner for 75 cents and champagne cocktails for a quarter. All of this in Gypsy Rose Lee, too. Our customers used to arrive in a streetcar. The whole family, man, his wife, the kids, everybody. I'd be out there doing the number and the kids were swinging back and forth on the railing. It was during that time that um, Mike had the idea of doing Star and Garter. And it was a wonderful show. It was beautiful, lush, extravagant, and wonderful. I remember one matinee, one of the ladies leaving, my dressing room faced the street. And uh, there were some friends waiting for her and when she came out, she ran into her friend and she said, Mabel, I have just seen, without a doubt, the dirtiest, filthiest show I've ever seen in all my life. Don't miss it. <laughs> now, the ex-pitchman's assistant became the Pied Piper of Broadway. He was able to charm the biggest names in show business into his productions. Cole Porter, Bobby Clark, Miss Ethel Merman. I've worked with a lot of producers, but none of them was as forceful as Mike Todd. He could pitch like a carny operator or make small talk with a king. But mainly, he had the great instinct for getting his ideas across, first to the talent and then to the audience. With his first original book musical, Something for the Boys, he told Cole Porter how to write the songs. He even tried to tell me how to sing them. In 1944, he drew four aces, 
four hits on Broadway at the same time. The money was rolling in, and he bought four legitimate theaters and a five-story building for his private office. But being Mike, he didn't gamble just on shows. He was also spending a few fortunes improving the breed at the track. He had a whole stable of bookies following him all over town to pick up his action. There's nobody around like him today, but nobody. He was the biggest winner on Broadway, but now he was ready to move on. He'd already turned down any number of contract offers in the major studios in Hollywood, but when an independent production deal came along, it looked good, especially as it would take him out of town and away from his wife. He'd been giving her a rough time for years, and now she was giving him a bit of the same. So he went west. Mike was fascinated with the idea of making low-budget documentaries. Out on the coast in this period, his closest associate was Jack Moss, a writer and producer. He was four years ahead of his time. The Hollywood odds were just against this idea. The studio was just not interested in innovations. At the time, there was a lack of consumer goods around and people had money to burn. Mike knew that Bing Crosby and Pat O'Brien were interested in selling the Del Mar racetrack. So he quietly hustled around and put together a group that came up with the necessary money. The horses started running at Del Mar, money rolled in, and as fast as it did, Mike rolled it back on horses that finished down the track. In that one period of just a couple of months, Todd gambled and lost $400,000. Everything seems to be going against them. He was separated from his first wife, and during a time when they were publicly feuding, she died an accidental death. His movie production deal had dissolved into a series of disagreements with the studio, and the relationship came to an end. He lost control of Del Mar track. He was finished out here on the West Coast. Everything he touched had gone bad. Without even a backward glance at the town he couldn't lick, Todd headed back east. I went out to the airport with him. He wouldn't say goodbye. He said, I'll see you. I'll be back. I'll be back with the biggest picture this town ever saw. I believed them. One of Mike's favorite lines was, I not only lost a horse race, I lost a horse track. Because he had. He done Del Mar race track and blew it gambling. Living with Mike Todd was like living with a circus or a volcano. He never walked into a room. He erupted. He was a marvelous husband and a marvelous man. He spoke for himself, and wherever he went, in seconds, he would be dominating and taking over. Well, you know, Mike was a guy, I guess, who's the greatest hustler and this town's ever had. He, he, he went for broke. If Mike needed anything, Mike always hustled better when he was tapped out. He'd like to go tapioca. So when Mike went out to gamble, he didn't, if he had $100,000 in the bank, he gambled to lose 120. He felt better, I think, when he was hustling. He was a typical, perfect American hustler. Michael Todd returned to Broadway, one million and a half dollars in debt. Television was the new entertainment industry, so he sold a comedy variety hour to one of the networks, but after three embarrassing shows, it was yanked. If that wasn't enough, his second attempt at marriage, this time to Joan Blondell, also ended in failure. So he went back to the one thing he'd always been successful at, musical shows. He produced three moneymakers with his eyes practically closed. But Mike was bored with Broadway. As he told his press agent, Max Gendel, he was looking around for something bigger. I remember one time we were riding in his car and he was listening to a radio broadcast of a news commentator and the news commentator was saying that some vegetarian had just walked up a mountain and there were no more mountains to climb and so good night until tomorrow. Todd stopped his car, which I think was at Broadway and 52nd Street, ran into the Western Union office and sent the telegram to Lowell Thomas Care of CBS saying, Dear Mr. Thomas, I know of one mountain that you haven't climbed. Signed, Michael Todd. Many years ago, when I accidentally discovered the Cinerama process, which was hidden in a Long Island laboratory, Mike Todd, along with one or two of my colleagues, 
went with me to take a look. It was in a barn in Oyster Bay, and when Todd saw this, he became a, a, a different man. I remember he stopped the car three or four times on the Southern State Parkway and called California. He's going to revolutionize the picture industry. He's going to take over the world. It's going to, it was just fantastic the way he reacted to, uh, to the cinerama. There's no doubt but what Mike Todd was a man of unusual talents. For instance, he was a super salesman and he was a brilliant promoter. And he also was a master charmer of men and women. And Todd was not what you call an organization man. And, he, and I remember once that uh, there was some argument with the board of directors of uh, Cinerama and he said, uh, listen, you guys are only putting up your money. I got my life riding on this. And in a way, he believed it and he was right. Some people kind of hated Mike, but they didn't know him. I think they were afraid of him and jealous. If you didn't know the other Mike Todd, he could appear to be absolutely ruthless. Of course, he wasn't, but he had a wild temper. But it was like a firecracker. It, it quickly exploded. It was pretty colorful while it was there, but it was quickly gone. And some didn't know how to cope with his authority, his sureness. The words can't and impossible were just not in Mike's vocabulary at all. Mike Todd's successes had been confined to the Broadway stage but now he was ready to make his mark in the motion picture industry, where he'd busted out a few years back. 1952, Mike was ready to begin what he called his gigantic three-horse parley. He sold out his interest in Cinerama, launched the Todd Ayo process, and then took the combined profits from these two ventures and bet his entire fortune on Jules Verne to win. time I started around the world in 80 days, I said I wanted to do a fairy tale for adults. I had a lot to do with this picture. It was my first, and it was a sort of a do-it-yourself job. Now, the way I got started was I parlayed, in case any of you people don't know what a parlay is, I began with a thing called Cinerama. And I said, you cannot be in a roller coaster or in the canals of Venice all the time. Sometime, someone might have to say I love you and the three things might interfere. So I started in Tardeo. And then in Tardeo, I was in with some people who were in, this may be libelous, some people who were in the motion picture business. Guys who have been in this business 40 years and have an answer for everything. These guys never make mistakes. In Hollywood, nobody makes mistakes. So I sold out of Todd A.O. and I parlayed into this. As a personal venture and a personal gamble, I had more latitude than people have with boards of directors. When I first started this picture, all the wise guys said I must fall flat on my face. According to the best brains of the industry, Mike Todd was bucking impossible odds, not unlike the film's hero, Phileas Fogg. Both Fogg and Todd were committing their entire fortunes to a long-shot gamble. Open it up. You're gonna need plenty of money. Whatever you do, never let this out of your sight. Well, you can trust me. I would cherish it like, like, like a woman. But don't make love to it, just watch it. Well, this here Billy is fog. I'm sure he's different. It takes a gallant, adventurous bloke to dash around the world like that. Oh, don't be so sloppy. Fogg and Todd were both masters of improvisation. 
and only their ingenuity, resourcefulness, and daring could carry them successfully to their goal. In a very real sense, Mike was filming his own autobiography. I thought I'd start a thing called Project Impossible. 50 or 60 stars, all in one picture. Now, I never got the people because they were stars. I got them because they were the best actors and fit the show. In England, I got Noel Coward. I knocked him off first. For example, in the case of Sir John Gielgud, he asked me point blank, my dear Mr. Todd, he said, who's playing the other parts? I says, Noel Coward. He says, I've got to see that. I says, there's only one way for you to see it. You'll be on the set tomorrow. And he was on the set. The problem was not the money. The problem was to get a man like Fernand Dell to play a hack driver in the Paris sequence. or Charles Boyer, a travel agent. In Paris, we had to move the cars out, and the police were watching. If you ask a cop if you can spit in the street, he'll tell you no. If you were casting for somebody to play a honky-tonk piano, you'd use one of two guys, Sinatra or Hoagy Carmichael. Well, naturally, as a guy who fancies himself as a producer, I'd rather use Frank Sinatra. I wanted Marlena Dietrich very badly for the bell of the joint. So I went after her and I said, look, I'm a gambler type fellow. I said, Marlene, I will shoot the scene and make no contract and let you see it. And if you don't like it, I will burn it. The chances I took, considering there were one or two other people in the same sequence, would have been a very expensive bonfire. The leading players were hired in fairly conventional ways, but he used all kinds of methods to get the other stars. He succeeded because the roles he offered were amusing, and Mike himself was even more so. Often he dreamt up a part for a star. Always they had juicy characterizations. As part of the sales pitch, he created his own elegant name for these small feature bits. He called them cameo rolls, explaining that they were small, jewel-like portraits. But he wasn't able to recruit all the cameos in advance, as he couldn't always anticipate where and what he'd be filming. opportunist and made many departures from the written script. I've only had one rule in show business, and that is if it's entertainment, they seem to forgive you anything. And I wanted to put this balloon sequence in, and I was told it wasn't authentic. As a matter of fact, the Jules Verne Society objected strenuously. Well, they wound up giving me a Jules Verne medal. I was criticized severely for putting Canteen Floss, who was a Mexican, to play the part of Passepartout, which is a Frenchman. I am, in, in my opinion, one of the great egotists of show business, because I know that I can make mistakes, and I've proven it, starting with my choice of a director. We started shooting in Spain. We started to shoot at 9 o'clock, and nothing happened. At 11 o'clock, I saw it was completely hopeless. 
And I saw that mistake. And so I asked this guy. I said, how does so-and-so and so get to so-and-so? And he took 12 or 20 or 30 minutes, and he explained it to me. This guy says, I've been making pictures for so-and-so and so-and-so and so years. And then he said the one thing that nobody should ever say to me. He said, why don't you do it yourself? I did. That's Michael Anderson, the young director I got to take over. He did a great job. We shot in every country that we show in around the world. My friend, the King of Siam, loaned me the Royal Barge. He once wrote some songs for one of my cultural achievements. Peep show. In Hollywood, we shot this sequence where Phileas Fogg makes the last leg of his trip from New York to Liverpool. He dismantles the ship and burns it for fuel. My best friend, a good director, was watching. And he said, what a beautiful miniature. Look at that smoke and so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so and, -so, and isn't it great? Well, it was all right, but it's late in the picture and everything we do in the picture is really real. When I say late in the picture, just about the last real big production number before we wind up the story. This whole sequence. Now, I looked at it, I didn't like it, and it worried me. So I took a loss, and I decided to buy a boat. And I made a side wheeler out of it, and took it out in the ocean and dismantled it, and it's for real. to the Henrietta. We're ready. Come right to it. Come full steam ahead. We're coming in whatever you say. Over. I gave you the word right now. Come on ahead. Is that clear? Very clear. Thank you. Very good. Marge to the Henrietta. That's it. Now keep going. Keep going. And make a... And, and get out. Get around in front of it. And when you get in front of the camera, swing all the way around. This is the uh, top turn. We want a lot of activity aloft. We started in August and finished the end of December. Then came little things like scoring and cutting and piecing together. But I looked at the prologue and it was phony. I threw it away and spent an extra half million on a whole new prologue just before we opened the picture. The money wasn't the important thing. I was shooting for the moon. October 17 in New York. The press and public acclaimed it. But I watched the audiences. For example, they applauded in the middle of a sequence. The geniuses said that when you're selling out and turning people away from the box office, I shouldn't even change the ushers' uniforms. I went back to the coast and spent a couple of hundred thousand dollars and fixed it. There's only one genius that I ever recognized. And that's the unconscious geniuses, as I call them. The public. You know, a lot of guys grow up and they want to become president of the United States. With me, I just wanted to grow up and marry Elizabeth Taylor. And I did. Our marriage ceremony was quiet and simple. But afterwards, might have ranged a spectacular 
Mike Todd doing his nut. I mean, we had firecrackers with M loves E and E loves M all over the sky. All of a sudden, the mountain became alive with exotic dancers doing a, a fertility dance. The party must have um, been rather bizarre to some onlookers because here was Mike Todd, uh, 20 years older than his bride. And his bride felt at that time about 90 years old because she was crippled and was in a metal sort of brace. And her groom, well, a 12-year-old in the height of um, activity. And his young bride was sort of hobbling along in her sort of wheelchair at the age of 24. And people were worried about our age difference. <laughs> As some of you know, I'm married to a girl who's a few years my junior. As a matter of fact, she's a few years my junior's junior. We traveled all over the world together to promote around the world in 80 days. Of course, we couldn't have gone more first class and we couldn't have had more of a ball. We arrived in Greece in our own plane and we opened the film, went through all the kind of hoopla and the ceremony of the uh, premiere with the royalty, and it was terribly exciting and very glamorous. And then finally we lost everybody, and we came, became the typical tourists. And <laughs> I took home movies of Mike, and he took home movies of me. I was hobbling around in the uh, Acropolis with one heel broken, and Mike was posing me up against goddesses. Then we went to the Greek islands, and we were riding around on donkeys. Well, we have the home movies of it. And they're like everybody else's home movies that are so bad, you wouldn't believe them. I mean, you couldn't believe that the man who did Around the World in 80 Days and Cinerama had anything to do with these home movies. But I must say, we had fun. Well, you know that Mike spoke no other language but English, and um, a lot of his English words were his own, his own invention, but it was it was curious, wherever he went, no matter what country we went to, he could always make himself understood to people that didn't speak English at all. One of the things about Mike that uh, continually fascinated me was his insatiable sense of curiosity and his interest in things, people, everything. For instance, when we would arrive in a foreign country, uh, after five minutes, Mike would know the population of the city, what the main industry was, what the best restaurants in town were, uh, how the political trend was swinging, and how the uh, public was satisfied with the way things were going, so forth and so on. Which was uh, a remarkable kind of talent, a genius, really. <laughs> It says that it's impossible for me to pass a microphone. So can you imagine oh, what it's like? To one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, we're really overwhelmed. Speaking for both of us, almost. I, I usually do, but we're really overwhelmed. Elizabeth, you thank say you. something. I never had a chance to say anything. I've actually forgotten how to talk. But thank you. It's wonderful to be here. <laughs> Two more words. You wish you hadn't asked. I promise you. <laughs> I think 80 Days received something like 70 or 80 awards from all over the world. But my heart was really in my throat the night of the Oscars. When it was time for the Best Picture Award and they called me up, Without thinking, I ran to the platform and I grabbed it. I mean, I grabbed it. I won the two biggest prizes you can get. The Academy Award and Elizabeth Taylor. That's not bad for luck.
In England, we had a nice crowd for the opening. There was a receiving line. We had royalty. And of course, I got Elizabeth a new party dress. Elizabeth enjoys shopping. It was very extravagant of me, but my greatest pleasure is buying her a little bauble or a picture to hang on the wall. Mike always gave a party every time he had a screening of Around the World in 80 Days. I had opened a small Chinese restaurant in Paris, and Mike was trying to be a big guy, so he said, I'll give the party in your restaurant. It only holds 36 people, I warned him. That's all I'm going to invite, he said. So sure enough, the picture was over and 110 people showed up. And my Chinese manager didn't know what to do, so he decided to quit. I told him, stay, water the one-ton soup, and cook every noodle you got. In the meantime, Mike got furious because there was no food on the table for his 110 guests who were standing all over the place and on the tables and everything. So Mike rushed up to an Italian restaurant a block away and bought 50 pizzas. And he came back and started handing out pizzas to everyone. Well, everybody finally got fed, at least I think they did. And they all disappeared. They drank all the champagne we had ordered from a nightclub up the street. And finally, at 3 o'clock in the morning, Mike got up with Liz to leave. And the manager stood there holding the bill for $700. And Mike said, yeah, bring it around tomorrow at noon to the hotel and I'll pay you. Well, as Liz kissed me, she whispered in my ear, you better get your money. We're leaving at 8 in the morning. As I said, Mike, we can't carry you. We don't belong to the diners club. Mike said, if there's anything I hate, it's somebody who questions my credit. And as Liz winked at me, Mike paid out $700. And I wished them both a bon voyage. We even had such fun fighting. We really were the most raucous fighters, no holds barred in public or otherwise. One time, Mike got three transatlantic telephone calls at once, and we got to the London airport about 20 minutes late and missed the plane for Nice. There was no other plane going. So, you know, for once, it was his fault, not mine. Well, I was teasing him unmercifully, and all these photographers and reporters were standing around. It was just a kidding fight, but we were both using old English and sort of old Italian gestures, which are even better than language. And uh, some photographer got a picture, and I think maybe it was Mike's favorite picture of both of us. Actually, I call it the only talking still picture in the world. Thanks, Todd. Welcome home. How was the trip? Oh, it was lovely. Thank you very much. When are you expecting the baby yet? Well, I'm not uh, uh, actually quite sure. I haven't been to see the doctor yet. Oh, I'm I going see. this afternoon, but uh, sometime around October, I think. Mike, there's been a lot of publicity uh, about your public spats. Yeah, I even what? Been reading something about a, your uh, about a champagne bottle incident. Uh, please tell oh, me that about is it. That's the most filthy all. thing I've ever heard in my life. I usually don't get cross. But the person that wrote this story is a frustrated old biddy who takes her frustrations out on her typewriter. And to me, it is such a sad commentary. And if anybody believes it, uh, that's even sadder. I wish everybody could be as um, unhappy as we are. Then there'd be no wars, there'd be no problems. The world would be quite nice. Would you suggest a good fight now and then to uh, married couples, Mike? Well, we're not introverts. We, if we have something to say, I say, hey, Liz, she always, hey, Mike. And I, if, if you make a Dreyfus case out of that, then it's too bad. But we're very, uh, well, I, I, we're, we're so happy. It doesn't uh, matter. I don't really don't care like what anybody even... thinks anyway, because we know. And we'll know well, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, if we're still alive. This and babe, incidentally, pardon me. This babe, incidentally, said uh, six months or something. You know, she's been in Hollywood too long. Yeah. Well, Liz, uh, I'm quoting you now. You once said uh, you had the mind of a child in a woman's body. Am I right? That was when I was 15, yes. Sir. Oh, I see. Well, I was wondering, since you've been married to such a mat mature man of the world as Mr. Todd, you feel you've matured somewhat now? Well, I hope so. Otherwise, I'd be slightly retarded, wouldn't I? <laughs> well, thanks very much, uh, Mike and Liz. And best of luck with the baby. You see, you're not playing with children. That was a pretty good comeback. Yes, that was pretty good. Really, uh, that was for me, not for your camera. <laughs> I decided to throw a little party. 
I invited only 18,000 of my very closest friends. It was the kind of a party where you have cold cuts and young people. Actually, it was quite a do. Not only did we have the 18,000 plus in the garden, but there must have been 35 million or so people that were watching at home on television. Of course, Elizabeth didn't bake the cake, but who could you find better to cut it? <laughs> well, the whole thing was an unmitigated disaster. First, there was a circus parade on 8th Avenue. There weren't enough policemen. They couldn't control the crowds, and the parade literally could not get into the garden on time, where it was supposed to go around the ring. Poor Sir Cedric Hardwick rode an elephant and almost fell off. It was absolute madness. Well, I was working the floor of the garden, and after the program was over, the food was driven in amongst the gifts, and that's when all hell broke loose. People were taking TV sets, cameras, parts of the airplane, a trailer. Saw one friend of mine drive off on a scooter. I waved to him. <laughs> it ended up with a scramble of thousands of people, all jumbled, sweating, tugging, hauling, thousands of gate crashes. And the waiters were hoarding the champagne and watering it down and selling it to people for $10 a bottle. I know, I got one of them. And the sight of chic, lacquered, coiffured, elegant women fighting with little kids over a hamburger. It was just wild. At that time, Elizabeth and Mike walked by, and Mike took the keys and he threw them up to me and he said, okay, Lenny, lock up the store. The party taught me a lesson. 18,000 gets unwieldy. Anyway, funny, Mike and I got home. The phones were ringing like mad. His friends and associates really just amplified, you know, what we'd been, what we'd seen. It was a total disaster. So Mike turned off the phone, shrugged his shoulders and said, well, they can't arrest me for throwing a lousy party. If they didn't like it, they don't need to come to our next party. <laughs> when Liza was born, she looked like, well, all premature babies, a bit like Methuselah. But to Mike, she was a total miracle. He is quite convinced that when he went to see her right after her birth, and she was in, uh, an incubator, and really breathing for her life, well, evidently in some sort of gastric spasm, a little hand came up and, and made a sort of sign. And Mike was totally convinced and told everyone in the world that would listen to him that she was waving at him and that she looked him right full in the eyes and that she recognized him and waved to him. And from there on in, she, he said that she was the most brilliant child and certainly going to be the first female president of the United States and, uh, of course, the first Jewish president of the United States. Liza did and does so much resemble Mike. Of course, she was only six months old when Mike was killed. She has inherited all of his gestures, his mannerisms, his vitality, and it's scary at times, but beautiful. On March 22nd, 1958, Mike flew back to New York from the coast in his private plane, the Lucky Liz. Elizabeth had a bad case of flu and didn't go with him. The plane was caught in a heavy storm over New Mexico and crashed. For five days, his death was headline news all over the world. Mike Todd died as he lived, spectacularly. His greatest legacy to me was the gift of love. Knowing not only how to give, but how to receive with love.
There have been all kinds of theories about Mike. The boy who never grew up. The man who grew up to his successes. He stimulated and catalyzed all those that brushed his past, but to this day, his motivations remain obscure. People still wonder what made Mike Todd run. I think the answer is simple. He just liked running. He liked to go. I remember that he often used to end his conversations by saying, thanks for listening to me. Good night. Thanks for listening to us. <laughs>